Hi everyone and welcome to an exciting piano review here at Mirian Pianos. We have with us today a brand new C. Beckstein L167. This is part of their concert class. This was a hand-picked piano straight from the factory. This has been opened up out of the crate just a few days ago. And besides giving it a quick tuning, nothing's been done to the instrument. I'm very excited to share with you what I have experienced on this piano. We're gonna be talking about its sound, of course, uh, some of the interesting aspects of design that Beckstein's put into this model, uh, the action, and uh, anything else that probably is going to pop into my mind um, as we're sitting here experiencing the instrument. If it's the first time to the channel, I would really appreciate if you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, uh, because then you will be kept up to date every single time we come out with a new video, and we are constantly coming out with new videos, uh, not just of acoustics, but digitals, uh, lots of comparisons, and just generally trying to share everything we know about pianos with as many people as we possibly can. So let's get started with the C. Beckstein L167 right away. could be argued that we are living in another golden age of musical instruments and certainly pianos. I think that you could say that we are in that uh, type of a dynamic because of China. Uh, and not because of China as a manufacturer, because of China as a consumer. For piano companies that have been able to transition to the new way of business where China is now one of their most active export markets rather than importing from China, uh, the rewards have been substantial. Uh, the wealth creation going on in domestic China, as many of us know, uh, is, is amongst the most active in the world of any market developing, developed, third world, whatever. Uh, and uh, Chinese culture is one in which the piano, uh, as both an object of, of uh, pride, success within the home, uh, cultural importance, cultural imperative, it's all there. Um, many, many uh, Chinese families and Chinese homes have a piano. And so for companies that have used that new source of market strength uh, to drive innovation, to drive quality, uh, and really push the market up rather than trying to appeal to uh, a lower price point in a mass, uh, mass market uh, type of approach. Um, we have arrived at a place, like I started with, where we really are in a bit of a golden age. Um, many companies are now producing uh, probably the best instruments that they have uh, in the last hundred years. And the piano I'm sitting in front of right now is a prime example of that. Uh, this is a C. Beckstein L167, meaning this is part of their top concert class. And it has a select company uh, when it comes to baby grand pianos in this type of a design category, this type of a fit and finish category. There aren't very many instruments that are going to sit side by side uh, with this, even on paper in terms of the sophistication of the design, the quality of the materials, the length of production. Uh, baby grand pianos are somewhat ignored by most high-end instruments. Um, and, but this is not the case with the L167. I think uh, the other instrument that really comes to mind that I would love to get this side by side with would probably be the Fazioli F156 because it's honestly the only other instrument I can think of that would be a fair apples to apples comparison when you just look down the list of all of the components, all of uh, the, the design uh, paradigms that Beckstein is going for, the length of production, blah, 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 blah. I, I really do think that that would be a very interesting shootout. So we'll see if the piano gods grace me uh, with that wish, uh, grant that wish at some point in the next few months or so, if we can get something like that side by side and, and go from there. But on its own, the L167 is really truly a remarkable baby grand piano. And uh, I would say it's, a, it's fair for me to say that it's probably the best baby grand piano that I've ever played, period. A lot of pianos have sweet spots. 
um, you know, ranges where everything just works, uh, where the, the attack is this, has this beautiful bloom to it, where all of the harmonics of the instrument are coming together, where you can hear that the cabinet resonance is at its most optimum. And usually it's an octave here or an octave there, and as you get to know an instrument, uh, it, it becomes a little more obvious and a little more aware. I've been playing this piano for a couple hours, and you know the most remarkable thing to me? This piano has about eight sweet spots. There's not one, there's not two. Uh, and especially with baby grands, and I don't know why it happens more often with baby grands, there will usually be two or three notes where I can sit down if you're really on a great baby grand, um, and they're just beautiful. I remember sitting down at a Mason Hamlin Model B at the factory, and it was this E flat, and I played that E flat, and I just couldn't, every time I played it, it's like the stars aligned. The rest of the piano was, was quite nice, but that note in particular was that sweet spot for the piano. Well, like I said, it isn't just, you know, eight notes, it's eight ranges, nine ranges, whatever, on this whole instrument is developing that type of response, that type of color. Um, I've never had that happen on a baby grand. Now, I should point out that this is not a randomly selected L167. This piano was actually handpicked from the factory. Uh, so, um, on top of everything that I know Beckstein does, generally speaking, quite well, uh, this one is probably like, you know, the creme de la creme. But just listen to the type of tone that this instrument produces. I mean, in terms of reviewers, I probably tend to be more on the positive side. In other words, it takes a lot for me to say something truly negative about a piano. Otherwise, I'm usually digging for positive things to say because, I don't know, I just like putting that kind of energy out in a universe. But every once in a while, you get on a piano where you don't even have to try to just say something positive. And what just literally happened there is I, for a second, forgot forgot that I was doing the review. And so that playing segment probably went a little bit long. Wow.
let's start getting into some specifics here. So the sustain on this instrument is really excellent and an unusual thing for a piano of this length is to actually have really even sustain uh, throughout the whole range. So I'm getting great sustain right even in the top octave that's as long as one or two octaves down uh, below. Uh, otherwise you have about very, uh, very, very even, very similar sustain from about, what is that, C5, C4, C5, all the way down to the bottom. The second thing is a huge amount of color and duplex scaling is something that you can do right and you can do wrong. Duplex scaling of course is the technique of adding a second length of string uh, normally behind the bridge where uh, that length is left to resonate sympathetically. So it's not that the vibrations from the primary length are making it through the bridge, it's just sort of an extra you know, wind catcher for anything else that happens to be going on in the piano. And sometimes piano design and scale design uh, results in that area being very, very active, and other times it ha adds almost nothing to uh, the treble, the attack of the note. And in this particular case, this is an extremely active duplex scale. which to my ear is something that's a very good thing. Now, this isn't a universally loved quality about pianos because there are many German pianos that don't actually have the duplex scale or it's a very subtle duplex scale. Uh, pianos like Grotrian uh, don't have the duplex. They have uh, either completely braided off or in, uh, if you take it out, you sort of wind up with a mixed duplex. Uh, but a piano such as a Fazioli uh, has an extremely precise and very active duplex and that reminds me of the treble that I'm getting out of this, which is why I said at first the F-156 would be such an interesting pair up with this piano. get over that sustain. As we get down into the mid-range of the instrument, lots to like here as well. Usually on grands and smaller grands when you start to get down into the mid-range you have to get almost down to a middle C or lower before you really start to activate those lower, warmer tones in the piano. And so what you wind up with uh, is uh, still uh, clear, but sometimes a bit throaty in, in this uh, range uh, for a kind of mid-range uh, melody, and then the left hand gets nice and warm. But you start to get some of that mid-range warmth almost above this C here. Very round sound through there. It 
It's also one of the reasons why there's a bit of a an oral illusion on this that you're playing a much larger piano when you're playing in this range. There are things on the bottom of the piano that make you still remember that this is not a six foot. This is 167 centimeters. So hence why I keep referring to it as a baby grand piano. But in this particular range, the amount of cabinet resonance you're getting out of this and that lower mid tonality could easily have fooled my ear into thinking I was behind a six foot piano, even a six and a half foot piano. Moving into the lower tenor. And that's where the length of the instrument starts to reveal itself. You lose the separation on tight intervals when you get down this, this low. Pretty normal with the grand piano of this length. One of the biggest reasons why pianists usually like to get the longer instrument where that's an option. Uh, if you're playing repertoire where you have close clustered harmonic structures uh, that are well below the middle C. bad with single note stuff. Clustered, you, you lose it. But if you're looking at a baby grand like this, and you can afford a baby grand like this, because for most of us, this is not a piano I will likely ever own, as much as I would wish it. Um, but for people out there where you have the budget to be uh, you know, shopping for pianos in this range, um, well over $100,000 for something like this. If you're looking at a baby grand, it's probably because there's a space restriction. And so if you're already limited to lengths like that, I don't know of any piano in the 160 or under range that's gonna give you that separation down there. So it's just the nature of the beast. You'll want to move up to the EA-192 if you're in the Beckstein range. If you're talking Fazioli, that would be uh, the F-183, I believe. The Steinway Model A. There's other aspects of the design uh, with the instrument that's contributing to the cabinet resonance, and this is something that's universal to all of the C. Beckstein uh, concert class grand pianos. They have this approach of rim design, which you r really could think of it as a full perimeter rim. Because not only do you have a very intricate inner and outer rim uh, lamination system around the traditional part where the rim is, and that's a combination of mahoganies, beaches, and uh, hard rock maple, um, but that exact same material actually continues right across the front. So you have a full perimeter uh, resonating surface uh, around the piano. But then uh, there are three hard connect points between the plate as well as those uh, support uh, structures or support beams or cross beams underneath that are connecting the higher energy frequencies that, that the plate tends to collect um, and is putting that right uh, into the rim. So you're getting uh, direct reflection from the soundboard into the rim, but then you're also getting these three hard points uh, that kind of torque and, and really inject a lot of that energy uh, through the lower support beams into the sides of the room as well. And that's responsible for the huge amount of cabinet resonance you're getting on this piano. 
Uh, on top of that, Beckstein recently started doing their own hammers, one of the last few companies to have their own hammers, and one of the only ones I'm aware of that in you know, 2020, 2021, started their own hammer company. Uh, most people are looking to, uh, you know, move to third-party suppliers. I guess uh, they felt that the wise thing to do was to bring it in-house. So they've done that. They've been working with their own hammers for a while now. And, man, they've, they've really nailed that. Beckstein spends an inordinate amount of time on their actions, and they do make their own actions. Uh, some of the components uh, come in from Renner, uh, but Beckstein builds, assembles, designs the geometries for all their actions, and this is the gold action that goes into this instrument here. It's the same action design that goes into all of their concert grand, uh, or their concert class grand pianos. They have uh, plastic key tops and raw ebony uh, black keys. I really like the feel of a raw ebony black key. Some people love it, some people still prefer the plastic cap. Beckstein has gone to that raw ebony uh, uh, feel on the black key. It's something that I think is good. The Uh, something else I noticed that Beckstein's been playing with a little bit over the last few years is, is the sense of weight on their action. Uh, when I played a Beckstein from about three years ago or four years ago, uh, it felt a little lighter than I was expecting to uh, right from the factory. What I'm now feeling on these, uh, this most recent example, because this eye is very, very fresh, uh, is that the the weight is a, a bit more down the 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 middle it's very fluid it's beautifully regulated but it doesn't feel light And the repetition speed for people where technique and, and repertoire calls for that is excellent. Um, Part of me thinks that the change uh, from the last couple of years may have just been the use of a slightly larger hammer and shaping that hammer a little bit differently. Uh, because without changing anything else, just putting a slightly heavier hammer on there is going to accomplish all kinds of things uh, that are generally good if you've got a slight, uh, an action that's feeling a little bit light without having to redesign the action or go into a completely new uh, set of regulating procedures. That's all I have to say about the action, and uh, now let's move on just to some other really interesting facts about the instrument before we leave you. Uh, the spruce that this piano uses is the Val de Fiemme spruce. This is the same uh, Italian source that Fazioli uses. Uh, it's an extremely uh, responsive wood. You're able to get it dried a little bit uh, better uh, than some of the other uh, woods out there. You can, uh, because the growth rings are a little closer together, uh, so it's a denser, drier wood. Um, they get it, I, I believe, a minimum of 1,100 or 1,200 meters um, w and always uh, on the north side. So less sunlight, less moisture, just guarantees a slower uh, growth ring pattern uh, on that spruce. 
So this is a red spruce variety, uh, or at least that's what um, you know, some in the industry would refer to it as that Italian red spruce. Uh, it is, of course, very white um, as in the actual color. There's nothing red about it. Uh, the piano uses a vertically laminated a bridge um, with a cap on it, so in that um, respect it's quite similar to what a Hamburg Steinway or a Fazioli would use in terms of its uh, bridge construction. And then the last comment that I would make about the instrument is the more I get to know about European built grands, and this is an adventure I've been on for 15 years and continue to learn more and more and more about the instruments, is you can really divide the top end of the European grand pianos into two camps. Uh, and they're generally a slightly newer design or an older design, but one of the biggest differences is the wood content in the rim. Not even just the thickness of the rim, but the wood con in content in the rim. And you have many that use beech as, a, as the default. It tends to be a warmer instrument. It tends to not have quite the same level of attack on it. You see uh, pianos like August Forrester using uh, beech rim. And you even have uh, like the Beckstein Academy version of this using uh, beech rim. Uh, it's, that is, uh, seems like the traditional German design. When people think of German pianos from the 20s, 30s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even several from today, that beech contributes significantly to its overall tonal character. Just like uh, hard rock maple contributes significantly to a New York Steinway's tonal character. But over the last 20 years, some of the top end manufacturers in Europe have switched to using combinations of hard rock maple and beech to add a different character and a different dynamic response to the piano. Uh, and Beckstein has done this with the concert class as well as, say, Fazioli. They've, in, they've added this hard rock maple content to the rim and it really does change the character of the tone because you get all of the colors that you would normally expect out of a European piano but then there's this punch, there's this immediacy to the response of the instrument uh, that a lot of people like out of a great New York Steinway and so you're kind of combining the best of all worlds. Uh, and so that's something that I've started to listen to more and more generally as I play all of these European pianos is just how much character is influenced by whether it's a rim with uh, the hard rock maple content or whether it's one of those more traditional, um, smaller laminations uh, using beech. Anyway. So thank you so much for watching this review, this exploration of the Seebeckstein L167, the baby grand, and one that I really have had a wonderful, wonderful musical experience with. I uh, hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about it yourself as well. If it's the first time to the channel, we'd really appreciate if you did subscribe, uh, hit that notification bell, so every time we come out with a new video, you'll know about it. You can check it out. Comment, uh, share it around if you think it's something your friends might enjoy. We have an ever-expanding community of piano lovers and piano appreciators from all over the world, and it's so cool to see people joining in and commenting from every corner of this wonderful planet of ours. Anyway, my name is Stu Harrison. This has been Miriam Pianos on YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again soon. Sun is right.